happening? Okay, so real quickly, because I know election night runs late and some of you may be anxious about the time, go ahead and look at your phone, see what time it is, get that out of the way. And then I want you to commit to giving your worry about what's next as a sacrifice to God so that we can be present here in this moment together and honor God's word. Okay, so if you've got the app, go ahead and hop into that so that you can follow along with the notes. Otherwise, go ahead and crack open your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are approaching the end of this letter from Paul to the church in Corinth. And I got to talk to you guys tonight. Um, the title tonight is about the resurrection body, hardship, doubt, and hope. And those are three things that we're going to talk about from this passage. You guys know what I talk about when I mention life is good. You know those t-shirts that have the funny little stick figures? I think it's Jake and Rocket are the name of the dude and his dog, in case you didn't know. You learned something. Um, there's also a life is crap or life is hard version of those, which is hilarious. Um, if you scroll down past the verse in your phone, I've got a couple of pictures in there for you to look at because they're hilarious. So if you need a little distraction or a time thing, life isn't always good. Sometimes life is hard. Maybe you feel like you're about to get eaten by a shark, or maybe you don't know that the shark is behind you, as some of these pictures show. And I got to ask, who had a rough week this week? I know I certainly did. I pulled two 12-hour days by the time Wednesday came around, and that was just three days into the week. So sometimes life is tough, and life can be really hard. Sometimes it can seem like you never have a good day. And so the things that I want to share with you tonight is why life is hard, how it's going to get better, and what made that possible. So let's start with our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 49. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen into each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as them is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Now it's interesting and something that I hadn't noticed until I was reading a commentary. When Paul is starting this segment, we see two questions. And some scholars believe that those two questions are coming from two different groups of people. And so the first question is um, a question of opposing doctrine. See, both of these questions fall in the camp of two kinds of doubt. And the first is a doubt of opposing doctrine. And the question is, um, how are the dead raised? They're doubting the power of God. So this question, Paul rebukes and scoffs, calling them foolish. He doesn't even begin to answer that question. It's foolish to question the divine power of God. So this actually makes me think a little bit of the Roman soldiers at the foot of the cross that are mocking Jesus in Luke 23, 37, telling him, <laughs> cool, telling him that if he really is the king, that he should get himself down off of the cross. I also think about 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. 
It says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then this is where the clincher is that I think applies to our text. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And then Paul very clearly says, avoid such people. So the first question I think falls into this camp, it's people who have the appearance of godliness, but they're denying its power. And so Paul calls them fools and doesn't even answer that question. But we see another question here, and it's a curious doubter that has a question. And Paul does answer this one. But I also think about Jesus' promise in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 or seven, excuse me, it begins in five. Uh, Matthew chapter seven, verses seven through 11. And it says, and Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven good give, give good things to those who ask him? He promises that if we ask, if we seek, that he will be found. Psalm chapter 9, verse 10 says, And those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. See, when people come to Jesus with doubt, or even when people articulate their doubt to Paul, they're met with gentleness and answers, right? It's not the questions that Paul had a problem with. It was the heart. And in these two questions, we see two very different heart matters. We see one that is a heart of unbelief and one that is a heart of uncertainty. An answer to the curious doubters, the uncertain, here's what we know and what Paul says about the two bodies from this text. To compare the earthly body from the resurrected body, the earthly body is perishable the spiritual body, the resurrected body, is imperishable. We find that in verse 42. The earthly body is sinful. The resurrected body is glorious. We find that in verse 43. The earthly body is weak. The resurrected body is powerful. That's also in verse 43. The earthly body is bound by need and forged by brokenness. But it is, the resurrected body is spiritual, complete, and whole. And we find that in verse 44. Paul uses a couple of different illustrations from nature and from creation, and one of them that I was thinking about was the bulb, and he talks about how like this has to be planted first before it can become another thing. Um, I went to the botanical gardens with a friend, and I thought for some reason I was a great gardener, so I bought some different things to plant, and they were nasty looking. I gotta tell you, like how that little crunchy thing that looked like it should go on a salad instead was supposed to become this gorgeous flower, I have no idea, but by the grace of God, right? But see, it's in the death of that plant and that seed that new life happens. And it's something that's so much more beautiful than that crunchy, bulb, right? So it is with our earthly body and our resurrected body. Now, in order to help us see the scope and the implication of this, I want to do, as my friend Aaron says, not just look at the lower story, because I think that's what we see that Paul's talking about here, which is awesome and it's beautiful, but looking at it in context of the rest of scripture, to look not just at the lower story, but also at the higher story of what is going on. We're talking about hardship and hope. And this is something that I get really excited about because it just makes things make so much more sense. For some of you, I couldn't contain it, and so I've been talking about it a lot. So for some of you, this will sound a little bit familiar. But I want us to go to Genesis. And I want us to look at the very first garden, the Garden of Eden. Um, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. In chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. And we're going to look at what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, the first Adam. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, this is important, so like mental note, Whatever. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
And then in the middle of this, we see in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 13, we have the serpent that's tempting Eve and that is misrepresenting what God said. And Eve takes a bite of the fruit and shares it with Adam. And we have sin and disobedience entering into the picture. And then jumping down to verses 22 through 24, it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man into the east of the garden of Eden. He placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Keep that planted in the back of your mind. See, here in the very beginning of scripture, we have a perfect garden. In Genesis 3.8, we see that God created us to live in the perfect garden with him. And it talks about God coming for them in the cool of the day to go for a walk. We were created to live in a perfect garden taking cool evening walks with God. That's the world that God desired for us to live in. And then sin happened. And here we also see there's two trees. There's the tree of life and there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The only tree that they were told not to eat from it wasn't the tree of life, it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So why does this matter? Why didn't God want them to eat of this tree? Was he being greedy? See, sometimes it's like, well, why? Lisa Turkhurst um, said when I heard her speak one time, if we have a wrong understanding of God, we will certainly have a wrong understanding of our circumstances. If your understanding of God or your belief is that he is cold and callous, then you're going to think he was forbidding them from doing something for their enjoyment, right? But if you have a right understanding of God and you know that he is compassionate, then you're going to wonder what is compassionate about this thing. See, God never wanted us to live with the weight of knowledge of good and evil. He never wanted that to rest on us. He never wanted us to feel like we needed to be judge and jury because that was for him and for him alone. So was his mercy saying, I don't want you to eat of this tree. It wasn't because he was holding back something from them that he thought that they would like. And see, life is hard because we were created to live in that first garden, not to live in the fallow field of death that came to follow, that was filled with a curse. Now let's go to the other end of our Bible in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 2, 14 and 17. It says, then the angel showed me, this is John writing, the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life. And that they may enter the city by the gates, which is just so cool. Like, it says the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. So in the beginning, they were pushed out of the garden and said, no, you can't come back. I'm going to put this, like, crazy, scary cherubim here with this flaming sword so you can't come back. And then in the end, they're saying, no, come. And let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who desires take the water of life without price. So forbidden from the tree of life in the beginning, beginning because of what happened, and then welcomed to come and eat of it in the garden in the end. And this is when we see a third garden. And this is where we see the second Adam that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. Because in the middle of these two perfect gardens, we find in Matthew 26 that Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus came to our cursed fallow field of death, and was fully obedient to his father in life and death and in resurrection. And like Jack taught us last week, it's the resurrection or bust. It's the one-two punch. It's victory. It's his resurrection that is everything. It's not just, it's not Jesus' life or even death that often get people hung up. It's the resurrection that people tend to take issue with. And it's the resurrection that should get us really excited about the things to come. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 through 49, it talks about how we have physical life through Adam and spiritual life through Jesus, who is the second Adam, or the last Adam. Read with me. It says, Thus it was written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. 
As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust and the curse, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. We see that God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden in his mercy. And it is because of Jesus and his grace they were able to enter back into the garden. Guys, the resurrection means everything. It's the defeat of our enemy that is death. It's the answer to being separated from God in the first garden so that we can enter through him, through Jesus, into the final garden, the second garden, into restored relationship with God. Jesus is camped out between these two gardens in the Garden of Gethsemane, fully obedient to his Father, making our resurrection possible because of his resurrection. And this is the part that just blows my mind, and I hope it blows yours too. It was by God's grace that he made Adam and Eve leave the garden. It wasn't that God was being a jerk. It was his grace. And we say, well, why? Because afterward was everything hard and it was death. Yes, so that through their and our eventual physical death, without the tree of life, because if they had remained in the garden and eaten of the tree of life, they would have lived forever separated from God. But because they were forced out of the garden and could not eat or access the tree of life, their eventual physical death means that through their physical death, they could have restoration and a resurrection and re-enter the perfect garden in the end because of what happened in the middle garden. Do you not see how God was not a jerk? It was his grace and his mercy that sent them out. Do you not see that the reason that this life is hard is because this isn't the one that God wants for us. He wants us to be in restored relationship with him, taking cool evening walks at the end of the day in the beautiful and perfect garden that he made. So what does this mean for us? Like Adam and Eve and all of the saints before, and all of those that follow until the return of Jesus, come here Nathaniel talk next week because he's picking up in that. We live in between the two perfect gardens in a fallow field of death, of brokenness, of striving, of hardship. Life is hard. So what is the solution? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Do what he told his disciples to do in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, verses 38 and 41. He said, stay, keep watch, pray, resist temptation. And they failed. But time and time again, he comes back and with gentleness says, guys, wake up. Stay, keep watch, pray, resist temptation. I also find great hope in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. And this is something I hadn't noticed until this week. And I was reading it. I was like, how did I never catch this? It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. So this is after Jesus was crucified. This is after his resurrection. It's after all of his earthly ministry. It says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. How can you doubt after you have seen all of this? And so often we say, well, if I had seen all of that happen, I would never struggle with doubt. Well, they did. They witnessed Jesus' ministry. They, they, they were there firsthand to walk with him through things. They saw him crucified. They saw him resurrected. They're here at the end, and yet they doubted. And so does Jesus rebuke them? No. It says, and Jesus came and said to them, man, like it delights my spirit that Jesus didn't give the Great Commission just to those that worshiped him, but also to those that doubted. And he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's his answer to their doubt. You may doubt, but I have all authority. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he says, I have authority. So he says, I want you to go and I want you to baptize. He doesn't call the qualified. Since when has God been about the business of calling the qualified? The only person I can think of in scripture is probably Paul. And I doubt he would have passed the test to become a follower of Christ because he was feeling, killing Christians. Like, I don't think that that's a really key element in the interview process of being a servant of Jesus right? So when has God been about the business of calling the most equipped and the most able? He's not. He just wants us to be obedient. 
He says, baptize them, teach them. And then he says, and know that I am with you to the end. And what is at the end? It is the resurrection. It is our resurrection leaving behind the crusty shell of this to be in this spiritual body that is not just spiritual. It's, when it says spiritual, it's not talking that it's a spiritual element that is not physical. Because when you have the seed that grows, there comes a physical element of that. But it is a completely separate thing. In conclusion, I want to go back to the very first passage that I taught on in the fall semester in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And Paul states in verse 2, I'm going to turn there real quick. He says, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. It's all Jesus, guys. The hope that we have in this life is found in his death and in his resurrection. And that is why we can live our life not in fear of death. We can anticipate our eventual resurrection. And I don't know where you guys are at today or what you're struggling with or the things that are going on, but I hope that as much as there's beauty in the lower story, that in the higher story, that Jesus is everything and that God has been about the business of redemption and restoration and resurrection since the very beginning. We've got the garden in the beginning, the garden in the end, and the garden in the middle. We have a God that lavishly, graciously loves us. And so if it's fear or if it's despair or if it's a struggle with doubts that's holding you back, God's not intimidated by those things. He's used people that have struggled with those very things forever. So as we close in prayer, I just want to encourage you guys not to let those things become a foothold for the enemy to prevent you from being obedient to the one who loves you so much. Pray with me. Our precious Father, God, I thank you so much um, for the love that you have for us, for the victory that is found in your Son. That as much as this life can be difficult and hard, we don't have to do it alone because you're right there with us. And God, I ask that we would be obedient to follow you, to submit to you, um, that we would let the resurrection power of your Son um, impact our lives. And God, I thank you for um, not just what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, but the message that you have written all throughout the pages of Scripture. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen.